welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to episode 42 of the Madden America podcast. This week, I'm delighted to have had the chance to chat with Dr. Peter Gordon. Dr. Gordon describes himself as a gardener with an interest in medicine. He trained in both medicine and landscape architecture before specialising in psychiatry and now works with older adults in Scotland. In addition, he's an activist and campaigner and has a range of creative interests, including filmmaking, photography, writing and poetry. In this interview, we talk about Peter's own experiences of psychiatric treatment and how we need to address the divide that exists between the arts and the medical sciences. Dr. Gordon, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today for the Madden America podcast. And really, it's a little difficult to know where to start because you have such a varied range of interests and accomplishments. So to begin, I'd like to ask about you, your background and what led to your fascinating journey of training in medicine, architecture and then on to psychiatry. Yeah, thank you, James, and thank you for giving me the the opportunity of talking about myself <laughs> um, and 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 my story. Yeah, it's I'll try and keep this straightforward, though it's anything. But yeah, as as a child, I was really quite backward, but um, and was quite laid back. I was able to sleep standing up, according to my my granny. Um, but I had very wonderful parents, and they encouraged me in learning. Um, and interestingly, I was just thinking, what, what, pro- probably one of my earliest memories was being pushed in my pram by my mum. And I saw up above me in the local shops this gold pot. And it was outside a pharmacy, of course. But as a wee child, I thought, that's a sweetie pot. <laughs> and why is this pot out of my reach? Um, so um, the, this was, of course, a mortar and pestle sign, which is used to sign pharmacies. But that imagery comes back in my films. And my father, he was a bank manager, um, but I was also interested in family history. And he took me up, me and my sisters up to a remote part of Scotland. And we had to, as a child, and I think this had a, a big impact on me, and that's why I'm sharing the story, is we had to record all the the dead Peter Gordons, my name, and there was many in this particular graveyard because it was a small area of, of many Gordons. And so we recorded, and it made me, I, I didn't think about it at the time, but I think afterwards it made me question about what's in a name. And, you know, because I was seeing all these Peter Gordons, the same name as me, and maybe in some ways I was uh, a bit affected by that. But my story into medicine, I did better at medical school. I've always supplied myself. I've always been uh, interested in exploring the world. Got good grades at a local comprehensive, went to medical school in Aberdeen, was quite shy, wasn't quite sure if medicine was the right pool for me because I've always had this creative bit and I've always liked gardens. So, <laughs> and I, there's lots of stories, but reasons for that. But I kind of see myself today as a gardener who just happens to be a doctor. And what brought me into landscape architecture was just serendipity. I, I knew I wanted to do something creative and I thought I could do it. So I finished my medical training and then went off to Edinburgh University and uh, I did better at uh, landscape architecture than I did in medicine. And then for, not for now, but for reasons, I ended up back in medicine and I've been very happy in my career. And for the last 20 years, I've been doing psychiatry. So that's the sort of backdrop. Thank you. And was there anything in particular about psychiatry that led you to gravitate towards it as a speciality? Yeah, that's it's. I suspect I'm not entirely sure why, but I like talking. I mean, you, it sounds trite, but I like talking to people and psychiatry gives you more time with that. And I think also this aspect, I, I wasn't conscious of thinking this way at time, at time but, you know, the, the, the sort of plurality of the way you have to think is different from general medicine. Or I would say general medicine should have part, should consider the way we think and feel is part of everything we do in medicine. And you need to have that plurality of um, philosophy, science, interests, I think, and, and psychiatry leans itself to that. So that may be part of it. Thank you, Peter. You have a really interesting mix there of the arts and the sciences. And I wondered if that mixture influences how you approach helping people in your practice. It's, it's, it's a good question, and I probably can't answer it simply. But yeah, my experience has had a profound effect, having studied what I can just loosely categorise them as in the sciences and in the arts. Um, and there, there, there's, there's a, a fantastic retired uh, chief medical officer from Scotland called Kenneth Calman. And I've, I knew for this interview that this quote would fit quite well. And, and he did a PhD in medical humanities. And he said, it is perhaps here that the role of literature and the arts generally can have an advantage by the author exposing poor health choices and behaviour patterns in a way which are more powerful and effective than that of the medical teacher or professor. The writer's imagination and expression can change things, 
the word can be powerful. So, yeah, I, I, I went, you know, going into having been very scientifically orientated and quite, and, you know, it's quite right to be looking through the microscope and getting things as detailed and organised as possible. But when I went into landscape architecture, I had to loosen up. But I also, it was this sort of metaphor about seeing the big picture. Mm. So you, your master plan, you had to see the overall view before you went and focused in on the detail. And that somehow has parallels with medicine in which we live in an ever increasing specialised field of medical practice. So the big picture, the generalists have actually, and my wife's a GP, so I'm, I'm perhaps biased, but I'm very, I'm very, I would like to be, I've always said I would rather be a generalist than a specialist, <laughs> a generalist with, with many interests. And I think we need somebody, a few people have talked about the need for a renaissance of generalists. And I would agree with that. It's very important we don't belittle specialisms. They are important, but they're part of the wider picture. And if you don't put them within that wider picture, they can get lost and they can and and harmful effects can result. Absolutely. And Peter, we've started already to talk about some of your wider interests. And I'm very interested in your campaigning and activism work. So what was it that motivated you to start campaigning? Yeah, it's the, the activism just sort of happened. But it happened for a reason, I think. And I, I think it's this, it, it goes, as, I try and explain this as simply as I can, but it's not easy to explain. But in psychiatry, we're taught uh, something that's, and it's still taught, I believe, today, about a method of assessing people's mental state, and it's called the subjective-objective divide. Okay, that seems a bit of a mouthful, but you've got to pick that apart and realise what that's saying. And it's it's actually, I think, philosophically and scientifically wrong to suggest that the professional can be somehow objective about your mental state because the only person that can be expert of how you feel and think is the person themselves. So I don't like that. And I think I think it's having ramifications in terms of what we're seeing right now in that psychiatrists, they're, they're well-meaning people. I'm a psychiatrist. I don't believe people are going to do to cause any harm. But I think this idea that we can somehow be to, be professionally um, superior in our assessment of people's individual mental states is is, is a false one. And I think the other thing I've seen in medicine, and again, it's a philosophical principle, and this applies right across the boat there, the base of medicine, and it's something I would want to see junior doctors trained in from the start, is to think about interventions. Now, let's not just focus on medications, interventions of any sort, whether it be medications, hip replacements, devices, uh, psychological therapies, any intervention has the potential for benefit and harm. And any intervention has the potential for benefit and harm in the short term, where most of the studies sponsored by industry are. And but also many medications have the potential for harms and benefits in the long term. And I think unless we listen to people hearing the subjective, we're going to the evidence base is not sufficient in this. You know, it should be evidence informed rather than evidence based, because evidence, what evidence is, if we think again, and I'm no highbrow philosopher, but I think again about how evidence is essentially evidence is in, in fields of mental health. I'm talking about is taking experience putting it into words and already putting things into words, words, you have a loss of that experience. You're not recording all. And then the words are then transferred into numbers. And again, from the words to numbers, you have a loss of experience. Now, this does, there's not, not a problem with the methodology, but we need to keep in mind that big studies, which are necessary for improving healthcare, are not sufficient in themselves. And this is particularly true for mental health. And I'm worried that my profession has lost sight of this a bit. And I'm also worried that the ethics of um, we, we we need not to get into a position where we dismiss experts. Experts are important, but experts, if they're true experts, need always to listen to the people because of these methodological uh, losses in, in scientific approach. And Mary Midgley, who's, she's a fantastic philosopher, and she's the one that I can read. She's now, I think she's 98 or 99, and she's, she, she writes very well about what this word reductionism, and she said, these doctrines are often bizarrely overconfident and oversimple. Well, I, I, I think that's true. And I think we shouldn't just necessarily focus on the, the scientists or the psychiatrists, the doctors and academics. We should think at a society level, why are we seeking simple fixes? Because because we want to we want to ease suffering, but we've got to realise in, in in doing so, we might actually make things there's potential to make things worse rather than better. Well, you made me think while you were talking, Peter, that many of the scientific studies that I've read are based on data from patient populations, but the individual voice is missing, isn't it? And I know that we can't have healthcare tailored to each and every individual, but 
we've maybe gone too far the other way and in looking at such massive populations we're perhaps missing the richness of individual experiences absolutely and 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 we we should see the value in both approaches but we should also be and and there's um you know both in listening to the personal and to trying to pull things together to understand the collective experience we just need to, to not divide those we need to be very careful about how we use language and um, I'm not entirely sure. I think we can all be guilty here. Let's be honest about how we use language. But some of the recent debates on antidepressant prescribing, the language has really concerned me. And I know it's not just me that's been concerned about it because it's tend to be polarizing people into into all bad or all good, whereas actually we should be listening to all experience. And I think my professional group, I've been dismayed by what I've seen from the Royal College of Psychiatrists in recent times. And I have no interest in personalising this at all. I just want to make sure that we do the maximum benefit and the minimum harm. Thank you. And Peter, if it's okay, I wondered if we could perhaps touch on some of your own experiences with psychiatric drugs. And I understand that you yourself have taken them. So I wondered if you could tell us a little about that experience. Yeah, no, I, I think it's very important that we, we we feel able to talk about these things, though I realise it's difficult. And, you know, I'm in this unusual position and I'm somebody who prescribes psychiatric drugs, though I, I increasingly have become a, a, what I would consider a, try to be a conservative and as careful prescriber as possible, talking about what we know about short term effects and also what we don't know about long term effects. And this covers all psychiatric drugs. And I think that was probably my bit of my lead in because I do psychiatry for older adults. And I've been aware about the the rising year after year in NHS Scotland prescribing of antipsychotics, antidepressants, sedatives to our elderly population, some of them very vulnerable. And I'm not arguing that there isn't necessarily a role for these medications, but my view is that the evidence shows in practice that we're vastly over prescribing these. And there's many different reasons for that. So that was my lead in. But my own personal experience was I was started on paroxetine, um, known as Siroxat in this country, in 1998, so a long time ago. And uh, it was really for social anxiety. I wasn't sleeping well, very well. My son had just been born and our sleep was disturbed. I was certainly not blaming my son. <laughs> it's, uh, but, uh, but it was for social anxiety. And this was in the time when I was busily prescribing and going to drug-sponsored lunches for the, what was called the Defeat Depression Campaign. And this was very heavily sponsored, indeed, absolutely underpinned by the pharmaceutical industry, as the Royal of College of Psychiatrists now agree it was. Um, but it meant that we, we were very much told that we should not miss any case of depression. And also that the, these drugs had much wider roles, you know, for gen, you know, the indications for Siroxat at that time were, were very many and, and gathering with, with each month from case studies. So from generalised anxiety disorder to uh, postmenopausal difficulties to you, you, you name it. Um, and so the indications. So I was starting Proxteam then. And then about six months later, I found it helped. I found it helped, helped my sleep. Um, made me feel a bit more relaxed um, I didn't know how much was helping um, I tried I didn't even realize then but uh, about six months later I just stopped it <laughs> I didn't think anything about it and then about 24 hours later I got this buzzing in my head and it was like it was like a drill it was like a pneumatic drill going on and I thought what on earth is this and I, I persisted with it a bit longer and then I started feeling flu like hot and sweaty and really unwell so I thought and then it occurred to me I wonder if that's related to stopping the paroxetine so I took the proxine again and I felt the symptoms went away. So that started, I'll keep it very short now, but over from then on, I tried increasingly a number of different times to reduce it as gradually as I could. And that was difficult because the tablet only came in one tablet of strength. Um, and eventually I went to liquid. And uh, over probably about 12 months, maybe a bit longer, I can't quite remember now, I managed to very gradually reduce. I felt shocking doing it, absolutely shocking doing it. My sleep was disturbed. I was waking up all the time. And then... I'd stopped it, and about two months later, I had my only episode of serious depression. Far, 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 far worse <laughs> than I did than what I'd ever been prescribed. The, you know, the paroxetine for anxiety, and then I ended up in hospital, psychiatric hospital, my only psychiatric hospital admission. I suffered, my family suffered. It was awful, and I also had suicidal thoughts, and it, it made me think. And then just after my experience of this, which took a more than a year out of my life. Um, I attended a Royal College of Psychiatry meeting, and I won't mention any names because the names don't matter, but there was a very distinguished professor who has led the way in prescribing of antidepressants in the UK, what you call a key opinion leader, very charismatic, very able. And he said to his audience, antidepressants, 
they withdraw, suicide effects. And essentially he got the clapping cheers of the audience of psychiatrists. And that is one of the only times in recent, it was one of the only time I think I can think of that I've ever almost cried in a professional meeting because I felt nobody's going to believe me. Nobody's going to believe me. And I've had a hell of a time. And so is my family. So that's my back. And here I am, however, 98, how many years ago is that? You know, we're talking uh, more than 20 years. I'm still on Proxtine. And I'm scared, excuse my language, I'm scared shitless to try and stop it because of the experience of going through the withdrawal, which I know will be hellish. And I realise not everybody goes through these experiences, but still, it's my real experience. It will be hellish. But I'm worried that um, I have what happened to me before and the effects that that had on my family, which were huge. Um, so that's that's my wee story of, of Peroxidine Soroxat, and it's hardly unusual, I know, unfortunately. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Peter. And it's hearing stories like this that makes me realise how unwise it is for professional bodies to make public statements that withdrawal is something that only affects a minority or that it's a very mild experience. Because clearly psychiatry is not listening to patients, but it's also not listening to many doctors, I imagine, who have been through this experience themselves. Yes, I share that. Share your view. I've been quite distressed and I know many other people have been too. And what we're not seeing is People who say that, people who, I think we should value everybody's experiences of any intervention, in this case medications, whether they're good or bad, and not make judgments. And those senior people in my professions who talk about the stigma that people like us who are just simply sharing our experience are creating stigma or um, or, or demonising medications. That's not, that's not helpful. It's not helpful to anybody. And science Ethical science relies on listening to people, always questioning what we are doing. And the prevailing wisdom, we have to we have to acknowledge, you know, there's there's a lot of um, we live in a world which is, incre- in my view, is increasingly medicalized. People are looking for answers. And I understand that. But we need to be careful of the consequences of this, particularly when the methodology may be made based on large reduction of studies by people with vested interests. Yeah. And I'm not I'm, I'm here. For anybody who thinks I'm all against the med- the pharmaceutical industry, I'm not. I'm interested in openness and transparency. And the same applies for psychological approaches. I agree with that. But we need, uh, I think, um, my view is that the, the senior people in Royal College of Psychiatrists are in denial at the moment. And I suggest there will be many reasons behind that. But I don't think it's helpful. Absolutely. And Peter, have your experiences influenced how you approach prescribing to your patients? Absolutely. Um, it's, 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 and, and I found, obviously, I can't speak what my what patients think of me, but I, I, I believe I'm a well-regarded doctor. And I believe that I, I don't believe this, um, this subjective objective divide, I think is very important that you can share some of your personal experience um, with your patients. And most patients generally like that. And also to share what we know with what we can say with some certainty and what most of the stuff we can say is with uncertainty. And when you by and large share that with people, unless they're in a very acutely distressed situation, they benefit from that discussion. And there was a beautiful book by um, an ex-psychiatric nurse called Nathan Filer, The Shock of the Fall. And I I remember picking out one quote, he said, I think that's what I'm going to do now. I'm writing myself into my own story and I'm telling it from within. And this is, it's just back to this bit Unless we feel we can share our experiences openly without being judged, um, we're not going to learn. And the science of well-being and mental health care is not going to improve. So this, I hate the expression wake up call because my profession um, about 10 years ago talked about a wake up call with many signatories saying that we should take the biological approach. I'm reducing it here, but essentially take a biological medicalized approach to mental health. No. I disagree with that very fully because I think that is, you know, and this, and it's interesting that the biopsychosocial approach it starts with bio. And my view is that I think psychiatrists, we generally believe that we are doing the biopsychosocial approach, but actually it's dominated by the bio because, and, and there's many reasons for that, which we don't need to go in just now, but I think we need to, I think we, the biological approach is part of this, but it cannot be the whole, it's necessary, but it's far from sufficient unless that we're just disembodied brains going around without walking legs and and living in the real world. It's preposterous to think that the bio can be the only thing. 
Thank you. And Peter, if we look to the future, how do you feel we should ensure that the biological aspects don't overshadow all the other factors that influence whether someone struggles or not? How could we better help people who are finding life challenging? I think there's several things and I wouldn't pretend to have any simple answers. But I think one of the first things is to say is you quite often hear psychiatrists and academics saying that if you give somebody a diagnosis, it's empowering and that it reduces stigma. But actually, we have we have pretty reasonable reasonably solid evidence to show that that's not the case. And that's certainly been my experience. There's a study by Angermeyer who shows that by giving a diagnosis, or some might people call it a label, you know, in a sense, of the day, you know, by giving a label, we're putting one or two words to a very complex presentation. But by giving that, actually, you bring about otherness. So this whole idea that by giving a diagnosis empowers people and lets them move on, it's not actually held up with, with, in the scientific literature. And there's the other thing about medicalization, Raymond Tallis, who's been a huge influence for me, he's a, you know, he's one of what you call a pluralistic thinker, a polymath. But he said, and what I'm not saying with this, by giving this quote, is that I'm reducing in any way the distress that people can have, which can be very serious. And I've experienced it as a result of coming off paroxetine, you know, very low mood and, and distress and 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 emotion, powerful emotions. But what I'm saying, but what Raymond Tallis in a book called The Summers of Discontent says, there are several things to be noted about emotions. The first is they fill the world with meaning. Now, we must remember this. You know, whatever we do, reducing distress, we shouldn't try and just um, any approach that just tries to suppress emotions or these things is going to have consequences because we're human beings. Emotions are very important to us. So I just I just want I just want I want my profession to be more pluralistic in its approach, less reductionist to involve the medical humanities to separate um, business, I, this is a naive, naive comment, but it's been part of my activism, to separate the, the world of business, which puts money first, from science. Science should be completely separate from that. Science should be looking, and science, the word science is very interesting. The science word only came into the, the dictionary, the lexicon, in 1831, I believe. But before that, science was very much included philosophy. And philosophy and ethics, in my opinion, have become divorced from science. And this is the sort of separation of the arts and sciences, the so-called two cultures. Mm. And I don't have an easy fix for this, but I think we need, as a society, we need to go back and think that they're not completely separate. What what gives our life meaning? Our life meaning is stories, is music, is arts, entertainment. And to think that they can be artificially divided from our mental well-being is, I, I think, is silly. <laughs> Well, Peter, since coming to know you, for me, you represent living proof of the power that a combination of art and science can achieve. And I'm so grateful that there are doctors like you who will embrace their creative and emotional side and allow that to temper the sometimes coldly scientific. Arts and sciences need to go hand in hand, don't they? They do. Yeah. Thanks, James. And um, I think I just want to end saying I'm really impressed by the community of, you know, whether we call it lived experience, lived experience is probably the best term, but it's really important. Important. And I think um, we need to work. It's a plea for people to be kind to one another. You know, the, what many people who have gone through prescribed drug dependence and withdrawal, we shouldn't get to this Jekyll and Hyde position, which we kind of feel, I kind of feel we're being forced into by what's happening at the top. I think we need to work together. And I urge a rethink from some of the senior leads in my profession of psychiatry at the moment. I really do urge a rethink because well being is based on listening and always re-examining what we do. Well, I'm so grateful to Peter for giving up his time to chat for the podcast, and I highly recommend visiting his blog, which is a fascinating and varied mixture of so many elements and interests. If you'd like to visit, it can be found at wholeousia.com. That's H-O-L-E-O-U-S-I-A dot com. So thank you for listening, and until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates.